we have been in the series called Essentials. Say Essentials. Essentials. All right. And so that means these things are critical for our lives. And we talked about the physical things that are critical for our life is where this uh, sermon series came from. It's air. How many know we need air? Uh, we need water. Who needs water? You got to have water. You got to have food. Come on, Louisiana knows. Louisianans know you got to have food. And so, and then you also have to have shelter. And so the first week we really talked about air. And I'm just going to brief over it real quick. Again, if you haven't seen it, go to uh, our website, go to our app. By the way, if you're watching, you can also do that. We literally have thousands and thousands of people every month that pull these sermons off and watch these sermons and they make an impact in their life. And so there's a tremendous tool. And I thank God for our tech team, Kevin Dale and all your team. They do such a great job with all this. Come on, give them a hand clap. We appreciate them so much. But the first week we talked about air, and it's, which is crucial, but we talked about box breathing, remember? And so God puts the air, he put the air in Adam so that he can live. Jesus put the air in his disciples so they can be born again. And so he's the, literally the air that he puts inside of us, okay? And we talk about box breathing where, remember, we were uh, Let's discussing, do it. Let's practice. you know, breathe in through the nose, bring out through the nose. And that was all about having set aside time with God where you're listening to God, you're pausing and meditating on God, and then you're speaking to God and you're pausing and meditating again. But also that Jesus is your uber Jesus. Come on, he didn't just come to spend time with you in the morning and then you to leave him at home. He wants to be with you all the time. And it's this idea that you can be in continual prayer and the continual awareness of God like natural breathing. You have deep breathing, which is where it's set aside time, and your natural breathing as, as we go along during the day. And how many know you also have the five-second prayer that is extremely powerful to help you. And so, and then we talked about water, which water, uh, you know, Jesus said, I'm the living water. There should never be, and this is according to Jesus's words, there should never be any Christian that is thirsty, parched, or dehydrated. Because he says, I'm the living water. And when you drink of this water, you shall what? Not thirst. Never thirst again. You'll never thirst again. There are too many Christians we learn that are looking outside of themselves because God is in you. They're looking outside of that to try to find the freshness, to try to find the drink. And instead of finding what's going to really satisfy them, they're drinking out of rotten wells. Or they're getting disappointed because as soon as they leave someone who does have fresh water, they go dry because you have an artesian well that God said, I put on the inside of you, and it's the Spirit of God that flows through us like a river. Just like the river that comes from the throne of God, we're made in his image. He has made now us to have a river flowing through us that we would invest in other believers as well as the ocean of unbelievers. And so we should be flowing in the Spirit, communing with the Spirit. There's no reason to go outside the humanism, secularism, or your own self or anyone else to find the freshness of God on the inside of you. And then we dealt with food last week. We all know food in Louisiana. Can I get an amen? Uh, Cindy, actually, we had someone that uh, they were in the last service, but they're up north. And when Cindy said, you know, the northerners do not know how to cook. And I said, well, well I, she I don't know if I said it exactly like that, but that's yeah. That's how I heard it. Little... <laughs> that's how I heard it. <laughs> that's how she heard it too. <laughs> And so I told him, I said, it's not that y'all don't know how to cook. I asked for forgiveness. It's, I did. It's, it's y'all don't know how to season. Can I get an amen? And they were like, well, that's true. That's true. And so it's, you know, the idea that Jesus is the bread of life yeah. and that we have been born into a new creature and this new creature can't live on Cajun food. This new creature has to live off of rhema. And rhema means a revealed word of God. Because the logos is the written word, uh, anyone could read the logos, but it doesn't mean they're digesting it. The only creature that can digest the logos into rhema is a believer because we have the digestive system to be able to break the word down and make it real in our life. I don't know if you know this, but last week I was trying my hardest, <laughs> Blaine, to have a, a cow in the foyer, a milk cow. I was going to put up some fencing, get a tame milk cow rod and put them in the foyer, put her in the foyer. And when y'all coming in, we're going to squirt milk at you. 
It would have been incredible. Y'all have never forgot we, we that message. We call Mr. Bill. He's like, what in the world? <laughs> he said, no, never mind. I, Bill I tried to it. find it. We could, and did. then I actually had a guy, oh, I had one. I said, man, that been, that's probably the Lord Spared just kind of y'all the smell. bearing y'all that experience. But we talked about where, listen, you can't just eat processed. We went right. to the children of Israel. They had to get up, get out of their tent, go get the manna, come back and cook it and then eat it. All right, we as Christians need to every day be getting up and going to the source. Amen. We need more garden Christians and less store Christians. Well, oh, back to the garden. Oh, preach it, preacher. <laughs> back to the garden, baby. We got to go back to the garden. We got to go to the udder ourselves. And we talked about, you know, anyone who has drank milk straight from the udder. And uh, I've done that. Anyone else here? If you want to experience that, Look. see me later and I will help you out with that. Amen. So today, what we're going to? Today, we're going to be talking about shelter. So think of it, honestly, um, shelter is one of the biggest investments that you make in your life. You know, it's a place, um, it's buying a home, that's a place of rest, a place of protection, and also a place of gathering. Mm -hmm. You know, I think about the shelters that we've had. When we first got married, we paid $20,000 for our first shelter. You can't even get a used car for that hardly today. A good one anyway. Right. And we lived in that, and it was brand new too. And so we lived in that for a little while, and then, you know, we outgrew it because we had six kids in a trailer. Wasn't it like 1,200 so square look, feet look, or look. something? Here, here, here's the deal. Ladies, you want a bigger house, just have more kids. <laughs> and you will force your husband to get a bigger house. Y'all don't listen to that. Anyway, maybe not. I don't listen to that. Uh, so anyway, so we were kind of busting out the seams. And so we got a house and we stayed in that for a while, served our purpose. And then we flooded. And then because of the damage, we ended up tearing that down. And so now we're in the house that we're in today. And we are loving it. It's been a great blessing. And so not just a place of protection, but such a place of comfort. And, and gathering, you know, making all of those new memories. Um, but we don't just need a physical shelter. We also need a spiritual shelter. Mm. Amen. Mm. Amen. Amen. Because uh, who appreciates that you have a house to be in and lay your head or do life in? Okay. If your hand's not raised, come talk to me later and I'll put you outside for a few days <laughs> and you'll be raising both hands. Okay. <laughs> but just as, like she said, we have physical houses, we also need spiritual houses. Right. And here's the problem I see in the world. There are too many people who are spiritually homeless. Hmm, come on, somebody. There are too many people that are spiritually homeless. And they're being totally destroyed by the, by the elements that are out there, by just the you know, the, the pestilence and the, the weather and all the different things. Who's ever had to stay outside uh, without a shelter before? You know, you can even go camp and a tent is not a sufficient shelter. Can I get an amen? Andre, I don't know if you remember this, but Derek, were you with Derek when y'all took them guys camping? Andre and Derek <laughs> took these guys camping uh, from the, our life house. It wasn't the life house back then. It was Ascension House. And uh, they took these guys camping. It was cold. It was like this time of the year, a little later in the year, and it was cold, real cold. And it poured down raining on those poor guys. And look, by the, the other didn't make the night. By the middle of the night, those guys were crying oh, because boy. it is no fun. Who's ever been tenting and it's raining and the wind blowing and it's cold? That is no fun whatsoever. They had to go through extra counseling, y'all, because <laughs> of that event. <laughs> but, but seriously, seriously, so it's, it's like that when, you, when you're without a spiritual shelter where it's miserable. You got people out there that are miserable and they're, they're, they're exposed to so much because they don't have the spiritual shelter. And then you have Christians who could have a spiritual shelter, but they choose uh, to not live in it. They choose to suffer out there or they have a renter's mentality. Hmm. Where, and, and, and honestly, I forgot what a renter mentality was like because I had rented early on in my life a little bit, but it wasn't until I got flooded and our house was, uh, had to be destroyed and we had to rebuild it that we rented a place in Baton Rouge. And so when we went to Baton Rouge uh, and we rented this house, as soon as we got there, I was like, okay, because I've got an owner's mentality. 
I'm looking, I'm, okay, we got to fix this. Uh, I need to bring a tractor over here. and We're going to fix the yard over here. We need to do this. Uh, inside, she's like, we can tear down these walls and move these walls. I could repaint Why? Because all this. We had this owner mentality. Yeah. But then it kind of sunk in. Wait a minute, this isn't ours. Yeah. And because it wasn't ours, we didn't, we lost any motivation to fix it up. Yeah. We lost any motivation to keep it up. I mean, we keep it up because we wanted to be good stewards to the people we're renting for, but you know what I mean. Yeah. And I, I even remember, the you bare know, minimum. recently, not, not long ago, uh, your dad and mom uh, divvied up the land to the three kids, and one of the siblings uh, actually sold us a, a, a piece on the, on the side of us, and I've always used this land. I've always used this land for my animals. I've always been out there. And I was like, okay, we bought it. We did the closing. And I just thought nothing would change. I was blown away that after the closing, the next day, when I walked on the land, it was different. Yeah. It was different because now I wasn't just using it. I owned it. Yeah. And there was a different mentality. And guys, it's the same way in Christianity. Jesus said it like this. He said, the renters are the hirelings. When it gets hard, they roll. Hmm. Because they have no vested interest. But those who are sons and daughters of the house, who are owners in the house, guess what? They there. And if something gets torn off, you fix it. If your house gets blown down, you build another one. How many of you know you take ownership? And, and that's a problem in the body of Christ. And it, for lost people, they're homeless. They don't have a spiritual shelter. For saved people... Some of them don't live in it, and they're, they're willingly homeless, or they have a renter's mentality. God says, no, I want you to be my children. Yeah. You've got to realize you're my sons and daughters, and you should have an owner's mentality. Who can say amen? Amen. You see, we're showing the scriptures to make God our shelter. Um, he should be our place of rest, protection, and doing life. And we see that in Psalm 61, 4. It says, let me dwell in your tent forever. How long, y'all? Forever. It's not like, you know, us with our kids. We eventually want our kids to move out. We're like, okay, eventually you need to move out and you need to, you know, and then we'll just be by ourselves. But God's like, no, I'm leaving these doors open and I want you to dwell in my house forever. It says, let me take refuge in the shelter of your wings. You see, there is protection there set up and the Lord's just saying, Come on in, come on in. And then there's that word, Selah. Selah means to pause, to think about it. And so God's like, I have set this place up for you. I have provided this for you. All you just have to do is take that step in. In another scripture in Psalms 91 and 1, it says, He who dwells in the shelter of the Most High will abide in the shadow of the Almighty. And so the, I, I love this scripture because... It's, it really clarifies something too. You know, a, there's a uh, scripture in the, in the book of the law, the first five books of the Bible, where it says we're blessed coming in and we're blessed going out. And I think too many times we use that mentality where somehow, you know, this is the in and out there is the out. When God said, no, 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 hang on. My, my end is not the hour and a half that you're at church. My end is my yeah. kingdom. And my covering goes wherever you're at. Can I get an amen? Amen. And so it's the idea of abiding. And abiding means to stay there. It doesn't mean that you just visit there. It means right. you live there. And so we need to be Christians who are abiding. Jesus clarified that when he was saying, hey, abide in me and I will do what? I will abide in you. And so we got to get out of this idea of I'm visiting God's house no, you're in God's house yeah. all the time when you are making him your shelter. Yes, amen, amen. And so as we abide in him, there's some benefits in that. We see in Psalms 31, 20, it says, you hide them, the Lord, okay? You hide them in the secret place of your presence mm. from the conspiracies of man. Mm. You keep them secretly in a shelter from the strife 
of tongues. Hmm. Now, I want to clarify, this does not mean that there aren't going to be possible conspiracies against you. It doesn't mean that people won't talk about you. It doesn't mean that there won't be gossip or slander thrown out there um, about you. But what it does mean is, as you abide in his presence, you are in the shelter of his presence, he will protect you from that. Hmm. And so those good, those things that the enemy tries to harm you with, the Lord is going to make benefit you. Amen? He desires for everyone to be in this shelter. You got to understand, even in the prophets, he said, uh, take your tent pegs and make them bigger. Yeah. God's all about making his tent bigger for people to come in. He wants people to come in. But the, unfortunately, a lot of people reject God. And when they reject God, there's a consequence to that by not being under his shelter. And, and this is what it is. Rejection of God's covering, well, number one, it gives you a messed up mind. You end up with a yeah. messed up mind. You ever, you ever saw somebody that was embracing something that was just really bad or wrong? Yeah. And you think to yourself, man, how can they embrace that? How can they be okay with this? You ever saw Christians? We just seen this. You had, you know, 70 million people that voted for a what that was for death, that was for destruction of an unborn. We can just stop right there. Or the taking away of religious freedoms, <laughs> uh, removing God from the public square. We can stop right there. And so we'd be foolish to think that some of them wasn't Christians that did that. And so you look and you say, well, man, how, how can someone do that? Well, one of the ways, one, you can be just deceived, but one of the ways, if you've rejected God as your shelter or you have a renter's mentality or you don't want to be under that shelter, if you rejected God in this sense, then you end up with a messed up mind where you're, you're embracing things that you would have never embraced before. Our society is messed up. How many you know we're embracing things as a society, not as a church, but as a society that 20 years ago yeah. was unheard of. Yeah, yeah, that's right. I mean, in California, they just passed laws to remove penalties for those that are uh, having intimacy with underage kids as long as the kid has consent. Like the kid's going to have consent, right? And so what I'm saying is it's crazy that we're even talking about this. Yeah. Our society... Would have never, I mean, that wouldn't even have been a thought. But because our society has rejected God out of public schools, rejected God from the public square, rejected God from making our laws, rejected God from the family unit, then we got a lot of people with a messed up mind. Yeah. And it says, they will, I'll give them over to a debased mind, and the men will lust for men, and the women will lust for women. That's homosexuality. And, and, but not only that, he said further along in that same chapter, he said people <clears throat> will themselves maybe not be a homosexual or embrace these wicked things, but they will heartily endorse those who do. So in other words, when you, i.e. can vote for that, you're putting yourself in that category where your mind is messed up or you're deceived. And so our country is messed up right now. Yeah. And so because it's not under the covering of God right now. And we need to get the answer is Jesus. Can I get an amen? amen. It's not a political party. It's Jesus. Amen. The answer is Jesus. So what's the next thing? Uh, the next thing is false security. Okay. You'll be put in a place where you think you're secure and you're really not. Okay. Maybe it's you're trusting in yourself. A lot of times we'll have that idea, hey, I'm good, I got it all together, I can get it done. And I know the longer I live, the more I realize I am not in control. I am not in control. Now, I know they have some control freaks in the room. I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand, okay? I'm going to cover you. No elbow bumping, okay? Don't, don't be like doing any of that. But I hate to tell you, you are really not in control. Okay, and so don't... You can't save yourself, I don't, promise you. Don't fall into that false security, okay? Another thing is when, when our trust is in money. 
You know, we think, hey, if we have this certain amount of nest egg, it doesn't matter what comes against me, I'm going to be okay. Why do you think our forefathers put in God we trust on the money? Because they did not trust in the money. Okay? One bad phone call. One bad doctor's report can strip you of everything you have. Money gone just like that. Yes. Look, I'll say something in Africa. I remember being in Africa and... I was with this gentleman that was a farmer, and he had done really well in his life, and he was older, retired, and he had over a million dollars that was in the bank, and this is a real story, and so he has over a million dollars in the bank, and all and of a sudden- And that's really good for, oh, for that's, Zimbabwe. I mean, that's good here, but that's yeah. huge in Africa. Yeah. That's like having, you know, 10 million in the bank uh, in Africa, and so he thought he was set, and everything's good to go. He woke up, and the country's economy collapsed, and he went- from thinking that he was, man, secure, all good, to that million dollars, over a million dollars, was only enough to buy him and his wife a good dinner. It was gone. Guys, let me tell you something. The Bible says, Paul told Timothy, he said, tell people who have money, you better not put your trust in it. Yeah. Because it will grow wings and it will fly away. He said, you better put your trust in me. And the way you know if you're trusting God or trusting your money is by your giving. Because he said you ought to be rich in good deeds and quick to give. And so when you're not giving freely and you're not being generous, then what happens is you're trusting in your money. It doesn't matter what you say with your mouth. It matters what you're doing in your actions. Because your actions actually show you what you believe, not what we say. And so the whole point is... You cannot put that trust in money. You have to put it in God. Right. Another area of false security would be trusting in others. You know, and God actually called the Israelites out in Isaiah um, 30. He said, hey, you have all this trust in Pharaoh and Egypt, and you're supposed to be trusting in me. And so we have to make sure that we don't put our trust in someone else. We're not putting our trust in the government or a political party, whatever That's it right. is. Come our on. trust ultimately needs to be in the Lord. Amen. And, you know, when he's talking about the spiritual shelter, it's a spiritual shelter that we have to get involved in and building. Yes. Okay. He, he, doesn't just, he doesn't just do it. We have to build it. Okay. And he gives us everything we need to build it, but it's up to us to build it. And so when you talk about a spiritual shelter, the first thing you have to do is you have to build it on the right foundation. Amen. There's a lot of people that build on the wrong foundation. They build on humanism, secularism. They build on their own ideas of what they think. They build their marriage on the way they think it should be. They raise their children on the way they think it, they should raise them. And that's building on sand. And what happens is you're building uh, in a way that when the storms do come, because they will come to all of us, spiritual storms, then it's going to collapse. It's never going to stand. And so you have to build on the right foundation and you have to build according to code. You know, here in our parish, if you're going to build something, you have to build it like the parish says it should be built. Now, why do they do that, Tony? They do that because they know that if they left it to us, we would build for fair weather. Hmm. And then when a, uh, when a hurricane came, it would be catastrophic, right. even more so than they are. Because we've not built with the worst in mind. We right. built with the best in mind because we wanted to do it cheaper. Mm. Can I get an amen? Mm. But that's not going to save you. Right. And so God says, you got to do it with the right material. There are a lot of Christians that end up building on the right foundation, Jesus, but they're using wood, hay, and stubble. Come on. It's like the three little piggies. When the big bag wolf comes and he says, I will huff and I will puff and I will blow your house down. (laughs) You won't catch me doing that. Come on, baby, do it. Show us your huffing and your puffing. Your face shakes a whole lot when you do that. I'm trying to stay kind of firm, you know. But but listen, (laughs) if we built with this cheap material because we didn't want to pay the price Hmm. of Christianity, like crucifying your flesh, come on, somebody. 
Yeah. Like getting involved. If we didn't want to, we don't want to pay the price, so we build with this wood, hay, and stubble. It's not going to withstand the fire. It's not going to withstand the, the wind and the storm. Or if we don't build on the right elevation, think of higher living. Can I get an amen? Wow. Then, then it's going to get flooded and it's going to get destroyed. And so God says, look, if you're going to build, you've got to build with the right material. Don't build with fair weather in mind. Build with the storm in mind. Amen. And build on the rock of Jesus Christ, which is his word. Amen. So our lives should be built under God. And to be built under God, what that means is you have to accept him as your Lord and Savior. Okay, and so if you haven't done that, then you aren't under his shelter, okay? So you first you accept him as your Lord and Savior, and then that first physical step to show that you are under him is to be baptized. As we saw today, wasn't that amazing, all of yeah, those baptisms this morning? And we baptized in early service too. We had I people was in the early crying service as well. crying like a baby over there, just beautiful. And so that's that first sign, showing the world that, hey, I want to build my life under him, okay? And then our marriage should be built under God. And first it starts the physical with a ceremony, okay? That's the difference between just living together, cohabitation, and an actual matrimony. It's the wedding ceremony, okay? Very important. And then with it comes that, your marriage being built under him, is you're going to have a divine love. I was actually sharing with someone this week that um, before I accepted Christ, I had a couple friends that were married, and I remember asking them, I said, how do you stand stand with that one man? Like, you don't get tired of him? Like, I had no understanding of the concept. I know it's crazy, right? That was a messed up mind. I had a messed up mind. And when I accept Jesus, I realized, oh, wait. There's more to this love. There is a divine love. And so my love for him grows every day. And it makes no natural sense, but it's a spiritual thing. I mean, it does make sense because you are great. It makes no natural sense. <laughs> listen, listen. The whole reason your eyesight goes is so that you can keep that incredible love. <laughs> if you want to have more love, don't wear your glasses. And man, you will stay beautiful to each other. It's amazing. That or, hey, you can install a dimmer switch in your bedroom. <laughs> you know, just. And then you get old enough, just keep the lights out. <laughs> Oh, anyway, anyway, okay, also, our children should be under God, okay? We start physically by we dedicate our children to the Lord, but then spiritually, I, you know, I am responsible for the eight Sturmer kids that I birthed. I am responsible for discipling them in the ways of the Lord, me. I'm responsible. And in that responsibility, yes, and you're responsible too, too. yes. <laughs> yeah, you are responsible. Okay, sorry, babe. I just can't keep forgetting Run you over there. Run with it, baby. Huff and puff. Come on. <laughs> I, I just see that. House down. Yeah, I ain't doing it. Not doing it. Okay, anyway. So, but I am responsible. In that responsibility, yes, I've brought them to church. I've put them in children's church. I bring them to youth. You know, I get them around godly people. But at the end of the day, I don't put my responsibility on those people. Okay, that's extra. I am responsible for their well-being and their spiritual growth. And then the last thing is our country should be under God. Amen. What does our Pledge of Allegiance say? I pledge allegiance to, to the, the flag, flag of the United, United States, States of America, of America and to, to the, the republic, republic for which it stands, one nation under, under God, God, indivisible, indivisible with, with liberty and justice for all. all. So my question is this, why are we surprised that we are so divided? Why are we surprised that we are losing freedom? Why are we surprised, okay, that we're losing liberty when we are not under God anymore? We've literally moved out from under God. Why, gosh, you know, in these past few months, I've been blown away by all, they are trying to, there's one state that is trying to make pedophilia a sexual orientation called child preference. Or youth preference. And you think they're going to stop there? No. 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 You give the devil an inch, he takes. So at the end of the day, that's why physically we need to have 
godly laws to protect the innocent. So when you talk about being under God's covering, you know, what does that really mean? You know, being under his shelter, what does it mean? It means that it's not just Savior, but Lord. Amen. Not just Savior, but Lord. It's kind of like this. Okay, if we're in a vehicle, Cindy, and maybe we have a couple of kids with us, and we get in a wreck, and, and then the, the vehicle catches fire, and we're caught in this vehicle, and one of you sees what happens, and, and you stop, and then you come, and, and we're trapped. I mean, we're surely going to perish unless someone helps us. And you pull us out of this flaming vehicle, and you save us from being destroyed. You know what? We're going to be very grateful. Who would be very grateful for someone who did that for you? You're going to be so thankful, so grateful that yeah. they did that for you. But it doesn't mean that you're going to go live in their house, does it? Right. It doesn't mean that you're just going to start, you're going to take your whole life, and you're going to serve just them the rest of your life. No. They're your Savior, but they're not your Lord. Mm. And there are too many Christians that take Jesus and they make him their Savior, but they never make him wow. their Lord. Wow. And guys, there's a difference. There's a difference. There's a lot of grateful Christians out there who aren't submitted under God. They're just not. Wow. And so you, you look, three things that show that he is Lord is when you seek God's approval and his pleasure. And the Bible says that if we're going to offer ourselves as living sacrifices, then we need to do so where he approves of it, where he accepts it. And so we want our life to be acceptable to God. We want the way we live our life to be pleasing to God. We, we want God to look down and say, oh, this is my beloved son or daughter and who I am what? Well, well pleased. pleased. And so that's our heart. And so our whole heart is that when he is Lord, man, everything I do, the way I, I live out my marriage, the way I raise my children, the way I work my job, the way I handle my finances, the way I live my life, I'm going to live it in a way that my sole purpose and my sole motivation is that he might be pleased. You see, that's living life from an inside motivation instead of external motivations. There are too many people that live in external motivations. In other words, it's all about the reward. Wow. It's all about the prize. It's mm. all about how people see you. And let me tell you something. You won't, you won't stay with it. Only the internal keeps you going. I live the way I live because I love God. Amen. And I know that he bought me. He bought my life. He owns my body. My children belong to him. My money belongs to him. My vehicle belongs, my house belongs, my wife belongs, everything belongs to God. Everything I have that's good was given to me by God. Mm -hmm. And by God, I want to be pleasing to him. Amen. The second way you know that he's Lord is when you bring things to God. In other words, you don't just make decisions on your own, but everything you do, you submit it to the Lord and you ask God, is this the right thing? Is this the right direction? Is this what I should do? And look, if you, if you never heard the voice of God, man, I, I encourage you. The Bible says his sheep know his voice. I've got a book out there. It's free. You can pick it up in the foyer. It's called, How Can I Hear From God? How Can I Hear From God? Listen, it is not rocket science to hear from God. He's made it very easy. You just need to be taught and learn how to hear from God and ask God. You know, in our life with eight children, you have a lot of conversations about children with people. And I remember, you know, Inevitably, people would, you know, talk about, yeah, we're going to have a kid in about five years. They would say something to that effect. And I would just say one thing. And I'd say, oh, that is awesome. You mean the Lord told you that? And it's like someone hit them in the face with a frying pan. Because they like, they go, I'm like, oh, I, I'm sorry. And I really was. I was like, oh, I'm sorry. I, I thought that's why you would be saying that. It's amazing how we shut off God from areas that we think we control. Hmm. And you know what? God will give you control of that. Hmm. I would rather have God over it instead of me be over it. Yeah, and so, amen. The, what, so what are you saying? What I'm saying is you should just ask God. But a lot of people are afraid to ask God yeah. <laughs> because they don't want to hear what he's got to say. Yeah. <laughs> oh, hallelujah. Thank you. You want to come up hey. here? I'll give you this microphone. Good job. Hey. Listen. I remember we went to a service 
and a man that he flowed in the gift of prophecy. And he prophesied over us and he said, I see children upon children upon children. I didn't hear another word the man said. I was like, what, what? Anyway. <laughs> but the, the point is, have you asked God about that? We ask God about the car we want, the job we want. But it's interesting, the closer it gets around us, the more we don't ask. Oh, come on, someone. Oh, I like this one. I'm not going to ask God because he might not like them. Hmm. I'll leave it alone. I'm meddling. All right. So the other, the other thing, the other thing, you know that he's Lord when your whole life's about serving him. Yeah. When your whole life's about serving him. When everything you have, everything you do is about him and yeah. your whole life's about that. That's when he is going from Savior to being Lord. And that's what, and, and until you have that, you don't have his shelter. Amen. And so it's in God's house that we find rest, protection, and fullness. See, Jesus said that he would build his house for humanity to come into and to find those things. And he came to build an enduring shelter. That means a shelter that's going to last. You know, I think really in America, we kind of don't have that. You know, I passed by a building yesterday. I'm like, what'd they do? They just tear buildings down here. Like they build them up, they tear them down. They build them up and they tear them down. Because we really don't build things to last a lot of places. We do have some builders that do, okay. Um, But you think about if you go to Europe. There are cathedrals there that are over a thousand years old. A couple thousand years old. And like you can walk in, you can... You can point out the Americans in the place because we're like, oh my gosh, this is a thousand years old. I've been, it's still I've been there. to a guy's house that was like, I was like, wow, this is amazing. He said, yeah, it's a thousand years old. I mean, that's amazing. But as amazing as that is, Jesus came to build a house for us, a shelter for us that would last forever beyond all of that. You know, and so, however, we see that we are also called to be laborers in the building of the shelter for the world. I mean, you take Noah, all right, because we, we think that God just does it all. And he doesn't, it doesn't work that way. It never has worked that way and it never will work that way. When, when God wanted to build an ark for, to save humanity and to save yeah. all the animals, yeah. all right, what did he do? He called someone on the earth called Noah yeah. and his family to change what they were doing in their life and to begin to focus on building this ark. How long did it take to build this ark? 125 years. I believe it was 125 years because after the flood and you had the expanse that was around the earth that changed the barometric pressure. And so before the flood, you would live to be 900 plus. After the flood, it dropped down to 125. And so after the flood, and so I believe it took 125 years because God was trying to tell us when we looked into this story is that your whole life should be about building this ark. Hmm. See, Noah, when God came to him and said, okay, I'm going to save you, but it's up to you to build the ark. He got his whole family involved. Yeah. Yeah. Can I say this about Christianity? A lot of people are wondering what to do with their kids and how to raise their kids. Let me tell you something. As soon as your kid gets old enough to serve, you ought to have them serving here at this church. Listen, I've watched it over the years. Sammy, I've watched it over the years. The kids that begin serving in children's as soon as they were uh, old enough to be helpers, when they started serving along with the whole family, Carl, you've seen this, What happens? That's the kids you see up here doing worship. That's the kids you see still serving God in all our different areas because they learn something. They learn that you make your life about God's kingdom and not about you. Mm -hmm. And in the same way Noah built the ark to save humanity, Jesus is the new Noah. Where Jesus is our older brother, but not just our older brother, but King of kings and Lord of lords. And he's saying, all of my family should wake up every day. Oh, come on, someone. Building this spiritual ark that's going to hold humanity because I don't want anyone to be spiritually homeless. Yeah. I, I want to offer them to come in. Wow. What happens is, is when you, you know, talking about serving, it actually gives you ownership. When you invest your time, when you invest your energy, when you invest your heart, it becomes part of you. And so you feel 
like you own part of the shelter as well, and that's what's so important. But we see, you know, like Solomon. Solomon was called to build a house. We're also called to build his house um, and our house at the same time. Okay, in the book of Haggai, the uh, chapter 2, God actually said, hey, I want you to see this, Israel. You're so consumed with building your house, yet you're wondering why there's so much lack. You're wondering why you have so much need. You're wondering why there's drought because you left my house in ruins. I want you to build my house. Not that you have to stop building your house. You can build your house too, but I want you to build it at the same time. Don't forget me in the meantime. Mm. You see, our example to our lives is Jesus, right? Amen. All right, and it's interesting that Jesus was a carpenter and it's a reason behind it. It's because he was a builder his whole, his whole life. Everything that Jesus has ever done has come from a builder's perspective. That's why when he came here on the earth and he was first physically a carpenter, he was showing us spiritually what we all have to be. Right. And that is builders. We see even in the beginning in Proverbs 8, 30, and 31, now, this is wisdom. Is speaking of wisdom, which is Jesus. 1 Corinthians 3 says the wisdom of God is Jesus. So it says of wisdom, it says, then I was, so this is Jesus, we'd be saying this. Then I was beside him, the father, as a master workman, and I was daily his delight, rejoicing always before him. It's interesting that Jesus did his work of building with joy. Amen. He did his work of building without complaining. I'm sure Noah and all his kids, when they woke up and said, okay, guys, we got to get all our stuff done, but we also got to build this ark, that they did it without complaining. There are too many Christians that complain about getting involved, that complain about giving, that complain about witnessing, that complain about building God's house, building God's shelter. We need to be like Jesus. Well, we're all builders, but we do it with a willing and joyful heart like he does. It says, rejoicing in the world, the earth, having my delight in the sons of men. So we see that Jesus loved people. Let me tell you something. You're not going to give, serve, and reach people if you don't love people. Because yeah. people are messy. Mm. And the kingdom of God is all about people. That's why we're called living stones. And that's why God calls us to build up people, individuals. You know, you know, it's another thing very interesting. You know, Daryl and Kami, I know you guys are builder. Roy, you, you're a builder in here. And there's others. Caleb, I see you back there, builder. You got all these builders. What happens when you finish one project? Do you just quit building? That's it? You don't build no more? No, you go to the next one. Guys, we as Christians never, we should never stop building. Yeah. We should go from one life to another life. And our whole life is about building others around us. Um, another thing about Jesus is he came to earth to build his kingdom. Philippians 2 talks about how he left heaven to come here to bring salvation for us to build his kingdom here. And I love right before it said that, he said that, hey, you people on earth, you need to be looking out for the interests of others just as Christ did. And so what he's saying is, don't think about us four no more, okay? We need to be thinking about the person sitting next to us. We need to be thinking about our neighbor down the street. We need to be thinking about our community. We need to be thinking about our state. We need to be thinking about our country and the world, okay? We need to be looking out for others because that's the heart of Christ. So Jesus was always a builder. That's why he came as a carpenter. He was a builder in the beginning. When he came on the earth, he was a carpenter physically and he was a carpenter spiritually. Because he built, he said, I will build my house and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. In other words, I'm going to do it to code. Amen. But he didn't stop building. He's so much of a builder, this is what blows my mind, that he didn't stop building even when he went to heaven. I want you to see mm. this scripture. Bring up this scripture for me in John 14 and 2. It says, in my father's house are many dwelling places. If it were not so, I would have told you, but watch this. For I go, I, I go to prepare a place for you. So Jesus was a builder in the beginning. 
He was a builder when he's here, and he's still building right now for you and I. Oh, isn't that beautiful? And so it's the same way with us. But I'm about to blow your mind for a second, okay? Because the Holy Spirit showed me something, Cindy, in this. He said, I'm there, and I, I, I want to build your dwelling. I want to build your place that you're going to be in forever. But watch me. Listen to me. But he said, I can only build with the material that you supply me. Oh, listen to me. The Bible says, don't, don't build up stuff here that, that rust is going to destroy and that thieves are going to break in and steal. He said, but build the treasure in heaven where the rust and the thieves cannot destroy and cannot, cannot steal. It will not rust. It will not pass away. So, guys, if we're only living for this life, you're going to end up getting to heaven and you're going to be waiting for a mansion and you're going to get a shack. Because the Lord says, I can only build with what you put in my hand to build with. Mm -hmm. And so he wants to build you an enduring mansion. But it's how we live our life here determines his material he's building with there. I don't want to get to heaven and live in a shack. Amen. I want to get to heaven and be able to have provided all the material. It's almost like David. And you got David like us and you got Solomon like Jesus, okay? David... He actually put up all the material for Solomon to end up building the temple. Guess what we're to do? We're to be the Davids that have a heart after God where we're putting up all the material so Jesus, being a Solomon-like, can build all of our houses and all of the mansions up in heaven for all of us to be received on the day we take our last breath or the time that the cloud opens up and the trumpet blows and we come to be with our Lord Jesus Christ. Come on, somebody. Are you hearing what I'm saying? We got to be builders in our life. Amen. Amen. So we want to end with this. Psalms 92, 13. He says, planted in the house of the Lord, they will flourish in the courts of our God. So if you want to flourish, the key is to be planted in his dwelling place, to be planted in his presence. You know, kind of the plants that do the best at our house are the ones that we leave in the ground. <laughs> Have you ever, you know, you planted something? I've done this to my husband. I'm like, I don't like that there. Let's move it. And then we planted it and said, hey, that's not working there anymore. Let's move it again. Eventually, I kill it. Okay, so it's very important that we be planted in the house of the Lord, and then we will flourish in his courts. Amen. Stand your feet, everyone in here, guys. I guess what the Lord is, is saying to all of us is it's a decision you have to make. Y'all look at me. Look up here. It's a decision you have to make. It's a decision whether you're going to be a builder or you're going to be just a, a dweller. God causes us all in here to be builders. And I, what I want you to do is, I want you today, when you're going to take that nap, after you eat that great meal that y'all going to all eat, and you're getting ready to take that nap, I want, you to, I want you to chew the cud a little bit. I want you to bring back up what we've been talking about, what God is communicating to us in this room. That are we going to make a decision to make his house our priority, to, to, be, to be an owner in his house. When you're an owner in the house, you do anything because you, you're an owner, you, you're an heir. And so you will build the house of God. He's calling all of us to be kingdom builders. So we need to make that decision in our life that this is, this is hey, it's okay to build your house, but you got to build his too. You can't abandon his and build yours, and you can't, check this out, abandon yours and build his. He says, no, I want you to do both at the same time. And he will give us what we need to be able to do that. So I want you to think about that. And I want you to bow your head and close your eyes, no one looking around. Maybe you're in here today, and we had quite a few in the last service. Maybe you're in here today, and you've never, you've known God as Savior, but you've not known him as Lord. You've never taken your heart, your real heart, and, and submitted it under him. And today, he's like, my tent is open for you. I want you to come into this spiritual shelter. 
But you got to come in. You can't, you can't experience it from afar. You can't just go, oh, it looks great. And man, I would like to have that. He said, no, you can't have that. You just got to walk in and give me your heart. If you're sitting in here today, I'm not going to embarrass you. I'm not going to put a mic in front of you or a camera on you, nothing like that. But if you're sitting here today or you're standing here today or you're watching me online and you're like, man, pastor, I, I just, it's time. I want to give God my heart. I want to put my heart under this covering, the covering of Jesus. If that's you, raise your hand. Say, that's me, pastor, right here in this room. Come on, raise your hand. Anyone at all. Say, that's me, pastor. That's me right here. Thank you. Anyone else? Says, anyone else? Say, that's me, pastor. That's me. I want to put my heart under the shelter of the most high God. Anyone else? Thank you, son. That's good. Amen. You raising your hand, son? That's good. Anyone else? Says, that's me. Anyone else? Says, that's me. Well, come on. We're going to pray this together, guys. We're going to pray this with those who raise their hand, those that are watching. And you believe this in your heart, and God's going to do something spectacular in your life here today as you come under his shelter. Come on, let's all pray this together. Come on, everyone in here. Let's say this. Say, Father, I choose today to bring my heart under your lordship. I say with my own heart that I believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. And today... I give you my life. I submit my life to you, God. So, Lord, help me to live the life that you have called me to live. Let me be the builder you have called me to be. Thank you, God. And I love you in the name of Jesus. And everyone said amen and amen. Come on, let's give the Lord a hand clap. Amen. Thank you, Jesus.